Ladies and gentlemen, this is a warning. To protect theater owners and the makers of this horror vision film, viewers with nerve or heart conditions are advised to cover their eyes and ears whenever this object appears on the screen or whenever this sound is heard. Thank you. It's pretty. Where is the ball? The ball's over there on the left. And that tall. So that would be what the Cloverfield monster would grab and throw it yeah. in the heart of the down there. <laughs> throw it into the west end. Kill a bunch of drunk college kids. This is our hotel, uh, the view from our hotel, the 12th floor at uh, Texas Fear Fest in Dallas. And this huge blizzard like conditions they had uh, yesterday is absolutely not the slightest hint of such a thing now that we have not to wear here. We were hoping to maybe get some snow, you know, drifts or something like that, you know. That added like an interesting touch to our uh, adventure, but. Nothing doing, and I can't complain about a beautiful day. It's you know a little chilly outside, but it's definitely a beautiful day. Just crystal clear skies, sun is shining. Couldn't ask for a nicer day as far as the weather. And uh, one of the first things that uh, occurred at the other hotel was that Ray found the trash uh, bucket and uh, filled it full of ice, and he found the trash bucket. But we want an ice bucket. We want an ice bucket, and I wonder if they'll charge us, done us for it. <laughs> but anyway, here's the room, and here's the beds. Michael Murphy's not with us on this route, and he's the lesser man for it. <laughs> we we don't know what's up on this one. Uh, it appears like really nothing is going down today except for maybe setting our table up. I'll show, yeah. you, what, I'll show you what we're in for today, folks. Oh, yeah. We made a stop. We've stepped up in the world of sponsorship. Now we're... <laughs> Gentleman Jack is helping us out on this trip. We made we a stop. That, we realized that beer just wouldn't do it on these yeah. convention circuits. So. I put a saw book in on that, or however much $5 it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah. We got us a mixer. Well, we didn't get mixer, but we got something to mix into the mixer. Uh, and uh, But anyway... We met Aaron, yeah. but he was kind of flummoxed, you know, had a horde of people trying to talk to him and all that, and he sh I shook his hand, and he said, yeah, man, you know, he said, things are kind of screwed up right now, but uh, we'll get you fixed up, and so that we may be doing most of these interviews we're supposed to be doing tomorrow, but I'm just as in the dark as anyone can be about how things are, are uh, worked here. Bad uh, news is we're well, not actually going to get to interview Robert England, but he did say we could interview Robert Wagner. Yeah, so we're well, you know. Yeah, I used to see him a lot on the uh, heart uh, to heart. You know, heart to heart, and I think he did some Carol Burnett shows and such as that. So you know, <laughs> kidding of course. Are we? <laughs> we may not be. And there's some bottled water that will only done you uh, four bucks if you happen to drink it. Oh, there's the ice bucket. Ah, well, okay. By accident, I revealed the ice bucket. Oh, okay. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Senior winces. Yeah. We might have to steal that. Uh, and we've got a mini bar. Go ahead and open up the mini bar. Gladly open up the mini bar. Let's see the selections that we have where we shall not be purchasing. 
But let's see what we shall not be purchasing. Well, we've got some uh, M and M's, uh, which are three ninety five. These are uh, gummy bears, four ninety five. Mini Snickers are three ninety five. The cashews, four ninety five. The Luna Bar, three ninety five. That's are the petite pretzels. And you get down into the drink selections. We have Evian water, that's two fifty. The Lacroix sparkling water is uh, two fifty. That's uh, looks like to, what a twelve ounce can. Your Red Bull gets you wings, not for four fucking dollars. It won't get no wings on me because I'm not spending four dollars on a Red Bull. Your orange juice is two ninety five. Coca Cola, it says on the card, and Diet Coca Cola, but actually it's Pepsi and Diet Pepsi. So I guess there's been some kind of shift in the. I guess the Cold Wars are finally over with now. The, the proud people of Pepsi have finally been able to sponsor or, or take control of their own government. And now these are two dollars a piece. You can get these in a vending machine in any Walmart for forty cents. Two bucks. Two bucks. Two bucks. The uh, cranberry juice is two fifty. And of course, if for some reason I was to slip in the tub in the morning, and uh, you know. Cut my finger. Just something, like something that. They they're kind enough to provide you a first aid kit, all for the low low price of just four ninety five. <laughs> I'm tempted to pay the five bucks just to see what's in it. I'm maybe sure. Like maybe a gauze few band aids. Band aids. So yeah, there you go. There's your your and a, the the bottom is refrigerated. Yeah. Uh, so the drinks are cold, and for five bucks a pop, they damn well better be cold. But we made a stop at Walmart, and we bought our own provisions, and we uh, we got some sodas. And I got some cookies and oh, chips yes, and bottled water, which I forgot to pick up at the house. This is where I'll keep the uh, keep the rubber gloves and the the uh, duct tape <laughs> after I've duct Tiffany Shepard's. We'll lock those in the safe. So Who's supposed to be here? We haven't seen us one celeb yet. We saw celebs as soon as we got into Texas right there, but uh, a lot of them might be arriving this evening. Everything's screwed up because of the blizzard, of which there's not the slap this hint of, which I'm a little disappointed about. I wanted to see some snow drifts. I wanted to see some, you know, wrecked cars and, you know, shit like that, but no no go. So, so far, it's, we're here. That's all we can say. And how this is going to end up, only God knows. You can't tell it. Hello, my name is with TechPit.com. Set this up, just, uh, yeah, this is uh, this, just proceed. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was going to wonder if they went down and charged us 10 bucks for it. And now, who told you this is true? Guy that, uh, guy that, uh, groomed it at the Adams Market.
you don't want to walk in the front door totally cold, you know, igloo, beer cooler, everything. Every room has got a plastic trash on it, and every hotel offers free ice. And it works just as well. You put this Gatorade in here, you come back an hour and a half, two hours later, and it's just as cold as Susan Sarandon's heart. <laughs> Well, I'll admit that last one, that, that, and that lasted through the whole weekend, pretty much. I think you did you refill it one time? No, I refilled it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I poured the water out the next morning. It was well, melting. Well, it did the job. I'll admit that. Let's see. There's that mirror that scared the hell out of me. Ray, Ray uh, was about to go talk to his own reflection earlier, and uh, we had anything to drink. mine jumped at me earlier when I saw that mirror. Well, it's starting to get dark, mm -hmm. 5 o'clock. Tomorrow, after tomorrow night, we won't have to worry about that. I like that. We spring out. forward. Springing forward. And that's, I love it. This is my time of the year when we spring forward. But, uh, man, it's starting to cloud up. We, we look, a, if you look, hey, look down here there. in the parking lot, there's a big panel truck down there from the Alamo Draft House. See it down there? No, sir. We're, we're, here, you bring it into the... I'd like to go to that place sometime. Oh, I see some, it uh, yeah, I see it. some folks walking. Actually, it's the Jonas Brothers. Look, ladies and gentlemen, it's the Jonas Brothers. Uh, I know we said earlier, but I didn't read the words on it. Okay. Okay, well, I guess that's... Dark bus. What happened to the RayBoucher.com banner? And did you, would you show that show that to Ray where you're in the the actual book uh, there? <laughs> right now, uh, we're in talks because of the fact that uh, issue six was had had one of these uh, kind of bow tie endings. Where I got away. Over. Oh, <laughs> he's good about that type of stuff. Actually, yeah. Uh, well, it's uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm, I'm screaming, running like a little bitch here in that one, sir. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know. So. But who would? <laughs> well, see, these were the moments we was trying to capture, which is, you know, they're all sitting there, stuff's going down. She's like, gosh, what are we going to do? And he bolts. But then it kind of comes back where, you know, he just went to get his chainsaw. You know, it's like, yeah, he's taking his chainsaw. And he's ready to go. Don't show me too much more. I don't no, want yeah. I want to start. I want to start with number one and go through. So I notice he looks like he's got interchangeable hands here. He's got the, he's got the army dart. Oh, uh, yeah, that's what it was. We kept it with everything that was in the series. I mean, he He's got his metal hand, he's got the chainsaw, and he had the boomstick saw. It was, it was a direct tie into all the things. I've got it.
I'm here with Mr. Ted White from Jason from Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapter, which indeed wasn't the final chapter, but we won't go into that. But uh, you have a long and illustrious career, and, and you actually have double, uh, did some double work for some prominent actors, uh, including who? Well, uh, John Wayne, Clark Gable, Victor Mature, Rock Hudson, Fess Parker. That's some of the bigger guys. Uh, but I've been in the business for 52 years, so, you know, I've been around a little bit. And what got you started in the business? In the motion picture business? Well, I was in the Marine Corps, and uh, I was in Walking Wounded in San Diego, and they needed somebody to be an expert walking for the Sands of Iwo Jima. And I was elected to go up there. And that's where I met John Wayne. And uh, that's kind of a beginning for me. And uh, of all of the characters, the, the Jason, uh, Friday the 13th, what got you involved in, in playing Jason uh, in, in Friday the 13th Part 4 after doubling for John Wayne? <laughs> And uh, but of course, for horror fans, he's you know he's he's uh, uh, one of the most famous horror icons in movie history. And how did you uh, get involved in putting the putting on the hockey mask? Well, I'll give you the quick story of it. They wanted someone that was big, and they wanted someone that was agile, and they they decided they wanted a stunt man. And uh, there were four of us that got the call. And we all went down, and believe it or not, we read for the part. When there was no dialogue whatsoever in the script, but we did read for a part. Uh, they selected me. I was back the next day, and uh, they told me what the salary was and so forth. Uh, after reading the script completely, I said, I don't want to do it. It's not the kind of thing that I do. So I turned it down and went home. And a block and a half from my house was a prop guy that was on the show, and he called me. And he said, Ted, did you take the show? And I said, no, I turned it down. And he said, well, you're an idiot. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know you're going to be on hold for six weeks. They have to make a body cast, you know, from your waist up. Well, now, when you're on hold in the motion picture business, you get full pay. Well, greed raised its ugly head, and I picked up the phone and called the producer and said, you know what? I've reconsidered. I'm going to do the part. <laughs> so that's how I got to be Jason. But And... Did you ever imagine that it would be something like this? If you would be, you know, idolized by all these horror fans and, and uh, be going to these conventions and, Do you, you know. You, you know, I turned down all of these conventions for over 25 years. I wouldn't go to them. And last year in New Jersey, they called me and the producer said, I'll guarantee you 5000 Well, for, you know, two and a half days, again, greed raised its ugly head. And that's the beginning. I went. So from there, I went to Germany two months ago, and now here, and that's the third one I've done, so I'm stuck. Well, you've certainly made a lot of horror fans happy, and uh, and, and I, you, you're going to have some business here to conduct, so I don't want to keep you much longer. Let, but me, I, let me just add this. Never, since I've been in the business in over 50-some-odd years, have I met nicer people than the people I've been meeting at these conventions. Absolutely amazing what beautiful, lovely people they've been. I want to make that clear to everybody. Certainly appreciate you talking to us, Mr. White. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, once again, here I am, Jay Reel, and I'm with Darren Ewing from Troll Two. And what did you? What is your involvement in Troll Two? I play the role, the pivotal role of Arnold, who gets uh, stabbed with a spear, turned into a tree, cut up with a chainsaw, and stuffed in the blender. Good times. And what I was just saying to you is. Uh, to describe Troll 2 to uh, someone who hasn't had their Troll 2 cherry broken, um, it is a genre unto itself. There's there's drama, there's horror, and there's comedy, and then there's Troll 2. Troll 2. Thank you. Um, almost indescribable. Yeah. You simply have to see it. You have to experience it. You have to let it envelop you. You have to smear it all over your body. You have to bathe in it. And then come out whole on the other side, but a changed person nonetheless. It really is like 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 passing a stool in many ways. Yeah. yeah. And when you were shooting Troll 2, when you were involved in it, did you know it would become the pheno the phenomenon that it is? I don't know if I pronounced that word right, but you know what I'm trying to say. Did yeah. You, were, were you aware that it was becoming what it became as you were shooting it. As I was shooting it, um, I knew it was uh, going to be a, a, a uniquely bad movie, and I honestly always thought that it would uh, find its audience. And this, I have to preface this by saying, 
we did not intend for it to be as bad as it was. We were trying to make a good movie, and it didn't work out that way. But um, I'm, a, I'm kind of a fan of good, bad movies, and uh, I always knew it would find its audience eventually. Uh, but on the level and in the way that it has happened in just the last couple of years uh, has been a total surprise to everyone involved, me and uh, uh, Michael, who was uh, the child star of the film. Right, right. And so let's, let's get him real quick. You know, you're, you're, yeah, Michael. You, you did a lot of screaming and... Uh, the, the screaming the, and pissing and eating bologna. That's right. And let, let's, let's, uh, let, let's describe how did the... Uh, the what is it, the uh, Knoblog Milk. How did that get involved in the movie? Uh, Neilbog Milk? Neilbog, sorry, I said Knoblog. Uh, Neilbog. Uh, yeah, uh, Neilbog, Goblin backwards, of course. He, how did he get involved in the movie? That's a good question. I've, I wondered how in the world Corn on the Cob with Green Frosting got involved in the movie. I don't know how, like, all the... You know, interesting, we learned that food references um, were, were pulled where we were filmed at one of the locations... The Italian film crew just kind of went through the ladies' cupboards and just grabbed what they could find. And so that could have been the reason for corn on the cob with green frosting. Uh, Nilbog milk, I don't know, man. I don't know where that came from. Must have come from the Italians, you know, Rosella and Claudio. And this is a rumor that I heard, and this was probably answered, and I can't, you know, I can't remember because it's been so long. It's been a while since I've heard it because you, you actually did a, a, a dead pit, actually, you know, had you on the show and, and uh, were featured prominently on, on a, uh, a a segment on the dead pit uh, program. But um, was when this movie was made, was it even called Troll Two at the time, or did it have another name? Was it ever? anything else when it was being uh, in production. Yeah, the uh, the film we worked on was called Goblin. Um, that was the one that was on the script, and for years and years before it ever came out, as far as we all knew, it was called Goblin. Um, why it became Troll 2, I could only guess, because it's not a sequel to the movie Troll, the uh, John Carl Buschler film. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the original. Nothing to do with that, and it's why there are no trolls in the movie at all, only goblins. Um, I, I assume it was a marketing move, but uh, how it became Troll 2, I really don't know. Um, from what I understand, Columbia TriStar got the rights to put it on video and thought they would sell more copies if they called it Troll 2 than if they called it Goblin. What you lack in Julia, Julia Louise Dreyfus, you make up for in one of the most profoundly bizarre experiences that you will ever encounter in a motion picture. That's right. And, uh, Thank you for speaking with us on camera. My pleasure. I knew the, the, the Dead Pit guys would absolutely destroy me if I did not get the troll team <laughs> on camera. We love, we love Dead Pit. We and, love Dead Pit. Yeah. And I'm a huge fan. Uh, right. And you had a screening last night. And how did that yeah. go? I, I went in. I, 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 and, uh, you know, I'll tell you what. It, it didn't happen until about 1.30 in the morning. But Troll 2 fans are loyal to the core. Uh, and they stayed up late and they stayed with it. We're, the Troll 2 fans are really quality over quantity. They're, they're, they're not a big, giant group, but they're a very loyal group of uh, individuals. And it's been nothing but good, fun experiences with this film uh, for the past year and a half since we've been uh, screening it. Thank you. The Cult of Troll 2, I suggest you join it. You'll never be the same afterwards, I promise you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jay. Sure appreciate it. And uh, if you're uh, if you frequent the Dead Pit message boards, then of course you are familiar with of the dead. And your real name is Joel. Joel. Yes. And Joel uh, has been attending the. You started. You came here yesterday. Yeah, got here yesterday. After that huge snowstorm that uh, kind of messed everything up, and uh, everything got pushed to today and this yeah. huge well, throng of people had a little little to drink last night a little hung over right now which kind of twisted it more than the snow but uh i'm over that now i think yeah. you know and what do you what do you think what's your impression of the, the convention it's you know? cool i, I mean I, I hate to compare ter, compare it to texas nightmare or frightmare but it was uh this one's better i think i mean overall just better organized and i know you guys have had some issues but but you know <laughs> As a fan, it's, it's really. I'm fun. committing suicide. I'm committing suicide later, but uh, right now I couldn't be happier. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, it definitely, as far as 
being like kind of out in the open, you know, at Texas Frightmare Weekend, which I, we, we had a great time at, but yeah. it, they had these partitions, you know, walls that were set up that, that kind of separated the, the uh, sections, you know. Yeah. Now it's all right out in the open. I mean, Hodder right beside us there. There he is. Uh, here's Nico Hughes, that, uh, the child from... I, uh, I'm from, impressed uh, that actually most of the celebrities showed up. I don't think any of them. I can't think of any of them. I don't, I don't know of any cancellations except for Tiffany Shepard, which... Uh, she didn't show up? Uh, she did. I didn't see her. Oh, you know. Man. Um, but we got uh, Troll Two reunion, you know. That's Troll that Two reunion, and, and we just got through talking to the Troll Two guys. Very nice guys, yeah. and uh, I'm sure uh, UB and CK will be glad to hear about that. They love that movie. So, Madman Mars uh, walked Mad up. Mars is here. Yeah, he he walked up and talked to us earlier, and I'm not sure if we're going to be able to talk to him or not. But uh, he's it's a very friendly man. He looks and, just like Madman in real life. It's weird. And uh, he told us that a sequel, is, or, or not a sequel, a remake is actually in the works, and he's involved in it, not as Madman, but as another character. That's but, a guess. So, uh, thank you, Joel, thank for you. Uh, kicking it with us. We've had a lot of fun yeah. with you guys. Yep. And uh, definitely is an experience, I will say that. It's been a lot of fun. So, for this posthumous uh, um, broadcast from Jay Real, uh, uh, please, you know, uh, tell my mother I love her. Um, Bury me on wounded knee. The final broadcast from Jay Real. So long. It's alive. It's you. Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, he he likes to rape. He likes his white bitches. He likes. <laughs> He likes to do him up the butt and and, and and toss that salad. Okay, I'm here with Gary Sales, the producer of the original, uh, the one and only, although there's word that uh, a remake is in the works, Madman. Uh, Gary. Uh, Madman Mars, the legend lives. Uh, of course, we're here also with Madman Mars, is, 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 uh, to his right here. Um, title. Of title. the new one, working title, would be based on his name, and it would be Madman Mars. Oh, so then the movie itself yeah, would be called Madman yeah, Mars. Exactly, exactly. And will this be a similar story or uh, a retelling? Uh, or it'll be working. It'll be the same thing, only different. Okay. okay. <laughs> Which would make it basically uh, a retelling, updated characters, little twists and turns. The the, the original audience is going to have some fun because. We've taken a few things and played with them. And the new audience is going to have some fun because we they're going to be surprised by what we do also. But the original audience is going to be expecting things. They're going to find it very interesting. Very and interesting. what kind of changes are you making with this version to sort of uh, be in, I, I guess, to, I don't want to use the word modernize. Yeah, stop modernize it or current. What are you giving the new audience, the new, uh, the, 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 will be watching the new Madman that was different from the original. Not that there's anything at all wrong with the original. Uh, kind of you to say. I appreciate that. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, when it comes to campfire tales and myths, uh, they're told for thousands of years. They go on and on and on. So we're going to do the same thing with Madman. We're going to retell it. Is going to be some things going to be the same. Some things going to be different. I can't really express the specifics of how we're going to do it. Uh, I can say in general there'll be lots of new fresh kills, as it were, uh, some new and unusual ways of doing things, uh, new characters that, that the modern audiences will relate to, because we did make this picture uh, 27 years ago. And like I say, a good myth will carry on and on, so we're, we're sure of the myth that's going to work. Campfire tales live on and on, and so we're just going to put in younger, you know, people that are more contemporary. Music's going to be a little bit more contemporary, and the effects and the, and the the things that we do are going to be a, a little more contemporary. And that's pretty much the way it's it's planned. It's Certainly, look, the living shit out of you is what it's going to do. That's what we want most. But as horror fans, that's what we want most. What we want to retain is what we went into in the beginning. We all of us have a sense for. Uh, and I don't want, it's not the, uh, uh, the old school of, 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 you know, suspense is as important as shock. 
Exactly. Going back to what originally drew us to those kind of movies is that to actually be scared and to be creeped out and to be frightened, not to be just completely disgusted and depressed. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We'll disgust you, no question. We will be disgusted. But, we'll be but, but disgusted in a fun way and in a way that, that, that reevaluates why we enjoyed horror yeah. films to begin with. Well, there'll still be story. There'll still be, there'll be story. There'll be some characters you can kind of feel, uh, feel something for, which is important if you want to enjoy them getting killed. That's what it all boils down to, a story. I mean, yeah. you have to have a story first before you can have a, a horror film that's going to last more than a month. Exactly. And that's the plan. Thank you so that's much for joining hey, us. Pleasure. Pleasure. I'm here with the one, the only, the original Madman Mars. I can prove that. Hold on one second. There we go. And uh, we've, we've been given sort of a, a scoop here uh, for Dead Pit fans. This has been revealed here at the convention, but it's not widely known. Uh, let's, let's let you describe what the scoop is. And I will. Introduce us to the young man on your right here. I will. This is my son, Jonathan Ehlers. Okay. And uh, John has a unique uh, position in that he was born, I was going to say filmed, he was born while we were filming the original film. We uh, were shooting in 1980, in November of 80. I had it on a beeper supplied by Gary Sales, and uh, my wife went into labor, and uh, I had to head off the set. We shot only at night, so I had to leave the set and dash away to the hospital, which was like an hour and 20 minutes away. But... I didn't take all the makeup off, and the famous story is that I was wearing part of it, and I had stage blood all over me, and I arrived at the hospital, and I was going, please, I need maternity, and they're going, no, you want emergency, and I'm going, no, I want maternity. So, 27 years ago, he was born, and back in the day, as we would wrap every day of filming, I would go back to my little cabin I was staying in, and I, and being a real horror fan my whole life, okay, I would say to myself, now how do they shoot these, shoot these scenes today, and how might this be a little different, and how could I tweak this down the road, and down the road now turns out to be 27 years after. But I thought about it for a long time, and I have worked in rework scenes, and what happened was, literally, I, my son's involved in film in California now, and I gave him uh, the basic outline. And I said, give me some believable characters that are young people and have them say things that make sense and that an audience will relate to. And he went ahead and did it. And uh, I actually read it with a very discerning eye. And I was going to get very heavy with him. But, you know, I loved it. And it was that great. And he has impressed me from the beginning to the end of the story. And uh, it's, it's, it's genetic, man. I don't know what it is, man. But it's... We've done the story, we, we've taken the basic premise of the campfire tale, we have highlighted certain things about it and expounded on those things. Uh, I will tell you this, uh, there's a little more done with Mars lynching in the beginning, that's only alluded to in the original film. There's a lot we liked about that, a lot we liked about him coming into that saloon in the middle of the night with the axe. And uh, we've changed a few sequences, what I tried to do was I wanted to do a film that would be stand on its own for those that have never seen it before. That was very important. But I also wanted to satisfy something for the fans. And I knew they would be anticipating certain things coming in the movie. I've even set up certain things in a familiar way. And uh, it changes. Things will surprise them. But I know how discerning people are today about kills and about blood and about so forth. So it's a lot more than just hitting someone with an axe, okay? Well, we'll give them uh, uh, kills that they'll remember, but we'll, you'll also give them a story that, uh, that they'll story enjoy I, revisiting. I think they will, and, and I think there are moments in this film that actually are very humorous, too, even though we're not trying to make a comedy. But, uh, you know, and we have characters you care about, and I think you'll like them very much. And the working title of the remake is? is actually goes back to the original title of the film back when I first got started, which was Madman Mars, The Legend Lives. We are now going to call it Madman Mars, The Legend Lives. And, you know, so many people who know the original film think the name was Madman Mars, and it really was just Madman. So we're going to go back to that, so that'll be great. 
certainly looking forward to it. And any idea on when this will actually going to come together as an action? We're tying with the notion of possibly fall 2009 as a possibility. And the other thing is we are negotiating with a fellow to, uh, to play Mars, actually, at this time that we might know very well. <clears throat> You might be familiar with the, 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 the man yourself. I you, may know you've him. You've got a good connection with I him. I know him intimately well. I've, I've seen him naked, which I don't want to talk about. But uh, yes, yes, indeed. indeed. Certainly looking forward to the remake. And of course, the original is no slouch whatsoever. Uh, revisit Madman. And uh, thanks for spending time with us on Dead Fit, Mr. Mars. Hey. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks thank so you much. And much. Nice meeting you. Very nice John, meeting thank you. you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Interviews that I got personally. No, don't, don't, don't spill the scoop yet. I'm not going to spill the scoop, but I talked to Madman Mars, a uh, quite lengthy conversation with Madman Mars and his son and the producer of Madman. Um, I don't know if he directed it, but he's a producer. Um, and there is a scoop uh, that was revealed to the, uh, the convention that was going to be revealed. It may be revealed before you actually see the video. We'll see. But um, uh, an interesting uh, 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 news item regarding Madman and the movie Madman and Madman Mars himself. So uh, that'll be fun to, to watch. Got that for you guys. I uh, interviewed two uh, uh, gentlemen uh, associated with Troll 2. So I got Madman, got the Troll 2 people. I got Ted White, who's uh, Jason from Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapter, not. Very nice man. Elderly gentleman. Uh, you would never know, looking at this man, that he played Jason at any point in his life. I don't know. He's a big old dude. He's a big guy, yeah. And he's fit for his age. Um, and he was very quite clear that he never... Uh, there. It was all uh, financial. <laughs> he did it for the money. And, you know, why not? And he did the con convention for the money. But he was very complimentary about the horror fans at the end of the, 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 uh, the uh, interview. Um, I talked to the, some of the black... Uh, Black Devil Doll uh, folks and uh, cleared up the fact that the uh, heavy set gentleman that was at Texas Primary Weekend that was kind of shilling uh, Black Devil Doll had absolutely nothing to do with that movie whatsoever and they wanted to clear that up and wanted to get on camera and uh, you know pimp their own movie um, so that's the good there's some good at this convention there really, there really was I I'm going to end this convention saying that I enjoyed myself mostly enjoy myself, but... And it's a big but. Let's get to the but, and let's let Ray Boucher uh, uh, take that but. Just for those of you who are listening to this, you know, all four of you, uh, we're actually videotaping this, you know, wave hello to the uh, the camera, Jay. We're, we're videotaping a uh, GCAS for the first time. He's, he's still threatening to kill himself. Um, there's one reason and one reason only why I came on this trip. And that is because we were pretty much black and white with no names, of course, signed any contract, guaranteed this, that, the other. That didn't exactly turn out to be completely true. The Friday evening festivities we were supposed to partake in, the Robert England interview, the John Saxon interview, the Henry Thomas interview, those were canceled due to the fact that, for one thing, of at least of the three, Robert England, for one, didn't didn't arrive here until probably late last night, maybe even early this morning. Um, but we, you know, we rolled with that. That's an act of God. Because of the snow. There's, there's nothing you can do about it. Right. 
However, we were told that we would have all access. We would have access to a green room or media room. And uh, one of the nice folks that we actually met here too, that you know we both have corresponded with over the course of the last several years, that never have really met in person, Johnny Butane from Dread Central. And um, the director of the convention couldn't really seem to give us any straight answers, so I went to Johnny Butane just because he was familiar with me and with Jade. And of course, his wife, Girl Creature, is one of the first people to review Dawn. Um, gave it a very favorable review back when Dread Central was whatever it was called as part of Chud. And, um, Creature Corner? Creature Corner, yeah. yeah. And so anyway, um, there is a media room. The media room does exist. Uh, he wasn't aware of this at the time. He didn't Johnny know Butane. Johnny Butane didn't know anything about a media room, so he went to find out. He personally went to find out about the media room. Uh, he came back some 10, 15 minutes later and said, hey, you know what, there is a media room, but it's actually being occupied by somebody all weekend long. So promises of arranging appointments for interviews, promises to have access to a room away from the convention floor where people wouldn't be mobbed for autographs or, you know, just to have a place to go and sit down with somebody, some quiet time, even if it was only for five minutes. To be able to conduct an interview in a more professional manner, something we weren't able to do at Texas Pride Mayor Weekend because they just they didn't have access to a room of that nature. We and of course, our big conquest was Robert England and Kane Hodder. You know, for, for you and more in particular Kane Hodder, which I was pretty, pretty proud to talk to him. But Robert England was our jewel in the crown, so to speak. Uh, interviews. And so, basically, the bottom line is, and th these are my words and my words only. I feel that we were lied to. I feel that going into this event, people behind the scenes knew that we weren't going to be able to do what they were promising us to do. And not only does that piss me off, this trip cost me and Jay both personally a lot of money to come to. They were kind enough to give Dead Pit the table, but the one stipulation that I had with Jay before we even planned on coming here, and we're talking about damn near two weeks ago. Call the guy, email the guy, find out what kind of access we're going to have, what we're going to be able to do, because if we're just going to go up there and throw $500 down the rat hole, then it's kind of a pointless argument for both of us. So Jay did that. Jay contacted the director. Jay was promised these things. And the way I look at it, not only was he promising Jay these things, he was promising me in, in these things. And in turn, he was promising you guys these things. The Dead Pit fans. The Dead Pit fans. The, the Dead Pit staff. Mm -hmm. You know, bottom line, the man did not deliver. He has done absolutely nothing to secure any kind of interview. And when, and when I talked to him today, the one time I was able to get a few words out of him, I said, you know, is it going to be this evening after, you know, you close the doors to the, the floor, uh, the, you know, the people that... that you know, bought tickets, that we're going to do these interviews. And he goes, uh, man, things are just crazy right now. Um, Sunday might be a better day. You know, Robert would probably be not, wouldn't be so busy Sunday, you know. Well, now Ray, like, has to, you've got things you have to take care of Sunday, you know. Um, and given the fact that, true, they had a snowstorm that knocked what was going to be uh, the festivities on Friday into Saturday, still, he, he originally he said, well, in the email he sent me, can we handle most of these interviews Friday evening? Okay, well, Friday evening, presumably, got knocked into Saturday evening, and here we are. We sold a t-shirt. We sold one t-shirt, but, you know, uh, a lot of folks are new to Dead Pit here. The main reason, like Ray said, that we were here is for these interviews. I mean, we wanted to knock it out of the park for you guys. We, and that we were told that's what we were going to be able to do. We were here to talk to Robert England, to Kane Otter, to, to Heather Langenkamp, all these people associated with the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, John Saxon, uh, Chris Sarandon. We were told there is no limitations of who we're going to be able to have access to and talk to. Full access. I was told that not once, I was told that five, six, seven times. Basically, over a week ago, Probably a week and a half ago, you were pretty much said carte blanche. Yeah. You know, whoever you want, make a list. And we, 
Well, we're more than happy to represent Dead Pit here and sell T-shirts and to spread the word about Dead Pit so more people find out about it. But, like Ray said, we spent quite a bit of money at Texas Rock Mayor Weekend. And to do this next convention two weeks later, spend almost as much money, if not more, in some cases, the reason why we're here to, to, is to do those interviews because that was... You know, uh, something that you don't see often is someone off the street, so to speak, being able to talk to Robert England and these luminaries of horror, and particularly if you're a horror fan, they're a big deal. That's why we're here, is for these interviews. Because, you know, if, if we're going to come up here and, you know, you sold a copy of Dawn today, we sold one dead piece of today. Dollars. Oh, you sold two, two Dawns today. So Jay made $10 today. <laughs> Jay spent $130 for the room Friday night. I spent $130 for the room tonight. We spent, you know, countless dollars on food. You know, yeah, we can go down the street and go to the Jack in the Box or whatever, right. but in some cases, well, you got to eat here, you don't have time. You know, you want a cheeseburger at the uh, at the Weston Hotel, the cheeseburger's going to set you back $15, $16. You know, we're out of pocket a lot of money, and we're really not making any money in return. The reason we came here was to be able to get some footage that not only we would be proud of, to put together into some kind of documentary form and show to you guys, but just for the experience of actually having this this all access pass we supposedly had that didn't happen, I just me liars liars liars. Here's the deal: the reason that I wanted to do this, the reason that I wanted to videotape this. Long story short, I've got a list of people you interviewed. If you recall, last night I made a claim of 24. Sadly, 24 is very very shallow. Here's who Jay talked to today. Jay talked to Ted White, as he said. He talked to two of the actors from Troll 2. So there's one, two, three. Jay talked to uh, Joel of the Dead, of Dead Pit fame. Well, you know, not really a celebrity, but a celebrity in his own right and a great guy. There's four. Uh, the director and two of the stars of Black Devil Doll. So there's five, six, and seven. And uh, Paul Ehlers, Madman Mars himself. The producer and, of course, Madman's son. So there's eight, nine, and ten. Ten people. I promised him 24. Less than half. Less than half. You delivered ten. That's great. I mean, we've got some, definitely have something to show you guys. But it is a disappointment. It really is a disappointment. Um, and, uh, you know, that certainly not, you know, CK and Uncle Bill. None of your you guys' fault, and, and uh, you were off at this table, and uh, but it was offered with expectations that were not met. Um, it was offered with promises, 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 right? That were not kept. Sorry, promises. Yeah. And this is my final word on this. Um, as Jay said, I refuse to do any of these interviews. I said I'll work the camera. I'm done with this. I'm done. Done. Done dead and done. Stick a fork in me, I'm done. Um, this guy, who I will not name, I'll give you know if I named him anyway, sue me, what's he going to get? You know, uh, Liar you, cheat, scoundrel, you broke my spirit. You disappointed me, you disappointed Jay, you disappointed the fans of Dead Pit. Because last night, I promised these guys 24, and Jay delivers 10. But i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to let this rough film get me down. And so in front of God and everybody, Jay, you charge those up batteries. Because we got 10, I promised 24, I'm giving you a rough film 30. We're going to walk away from this place with our head held high. Fuck these guys that tried to screw us in the ass. We will have 30. By the time we leave Dallas, Texas, that's my promise to you. Walk hard, hard down life's rocky road. Walk bold, hard at my creed, my cold. I've been scorned and slandered and ridiculed too. I struggle every day my whole life through I seem to share all the worst that this world can give But I still got a dream and a burning rage to live
Well, welcome to uh, Fear Fest 2, uh, last day of the convention Sunday, and of course with us, C.J. Graham, who, uh, among other things, Jason, in Friday the 13th, Part 6, Jason Lives, a, uh, an interpretation, Jason, that I love, because like a lot of fans, we didn't like what happened in Part 5, and we were so happy to see Jason come back. Also, uh, Hell Cop from Highway to Hell, among other things. Um, if I remember reading correctly, you were a, were you a bouncer at the time you took the, uh, the the role of Jason? Yeah, I was managing a nightclub in uh, Los Angeles. So I was a general manager of a club, and uh, one of the hypnotists we had did a show and brought the special effects crew in from uh, Real Effects. And for whatever reason, they kept saying, we're going to cast you as Jason. I said, okay, yeah, right. Uh, lo and behold, hey, they put me in Covington, Georgia, and told me to go kill some people, and I did. Well, you know, it, it's, uh, as I was saying a minute ago... Glad to see him come back from the dead. Uh, obviously, with the horror crowd, the conventions, you do many of these during the year, you, you get a lot of response. Uh, or do you, Does it ever annoy you that, you know, ah, Jason this, Jason that? No, actually, I, I you know, you, it's the only time you can do a part iconically, historically, 30 years later, and still be known for a part that you did or pursued in. Now, it's not a bit, I do one, maybe two conventions a year, Max. Um, don't want to burn my bridges, don't want to annoy anybody myself. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, with the, the Hell Cop role, of course, we, you, you had your banner hanging up. The very interesting uh, prosthetic makeup on that character. Was that, uh, must have been pretty form-fitting, uncomfortable to wear in that, uh, in that part? Yeah, it was about five and a half hours of makeup. You know, I sat in a makeup chair at about 3 o'clock in the morning and watched MTV and fell asleep while they applied. And uh, five hours into it, five and a half hours, they'd say, okay, you're ready for a set call. So those were some 12, 13, 14-hour days. And, of course, you do have a website. So for all the folks out there who want to uh, visit your website online, let's uh, give them that uh, web address. It's real simple, just jason6.com, jasonvi.com. C.J. Graham, we appreciate you spending time with us today. Thanks a lot. Nice Nice to meet you. Once again, we are here at uh, Fear Fest 2 in uh, beautiful Dallas, Texas. And with me... uh, some of you may recognize him, some of you may not. Miko Hughes, the, uh, the star of such uh, classics as Pet Cemetery, of course played uh, Heather Langenkamp's son in uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Nice to meet you. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, yeah, having a good time. Crowd been treating you nice. I noticed you've had, you've had a lot of the, the ladies coming by. Oh, you were so cute in Pet Cemetery. Yeah, yeah, it's been pretty good. Uh, it's been a good uh, crowd response. Uh, Texas has good energy. I've never done an event here before, and uh, I like it. Like, I want to come back. It seems like a, a really good good people here. So, Well, you know, one of the questions I know you probably get asked a million times is, you know, do you remember any of that? that you know, and, and uh, Jay, of course, he, he loves Fred Gwynn. You know, how, how could you kill Herman Munster? But you, how, how old were you? I mean, you were just an infant, basically, when that movie was shot, I guess. I want to say I just turned three. I was pretty young. Um, yeah, it's weird. I have I have vague memories of it. Uh, like, kind of weird, random little kid stuff that probably doesn't matter, but for whatever reason, it just kind of sticks in your head. And, and it's been such a big part of my life. Like, I, I've grown up with it, and I've, I've heard all about it, and I've told the story so much that... I think, hopefully anyway, a lot of that is, is burned in my brain that otherwise might not have been. Because, you know, most people don't remember a lot of stuff from being two or three. But actually, I, I filmed an independent movie a few years back, and I was able to go to New Jersey, um, or New Hampshire, where the, the original house was. And uh, we went back and visited, and they, the people that lived there were really generous. They let us come in and, and see everything. And it was weird. I felt like I'd been there before. Like, I knew, like, down that hallway, there's a room on the left, and, like, I could... I could name stuff like that, but but at the same time, I wasn't familiar. Like, it was totally new. It was, it was surreal. It was kind of cool. Well, I'll tell you what. We certainly appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. We've had the table here next to you, and you've been real busy this weekend. Uh, any websites you want to promote? Anything else going on you want to talk about before we go? Oh, I'd, if you guys want to hit me up on MySpace, add me as a friend. That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. Miko know. Hughes. Hey, we appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, man. Nice to meet you. For sure. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back here, uh, Ray Boucher, Fear Fest 2 in Dallas, Texas. Of course, this man needs no introduction, but we'll do it anyway. Gunnar Hansen, the original and, in most people's opinion, the best Leatherface from the uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mr. Hansen, nice to meet you. How are you doing today? <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, you know, you've had a consistently busy weekend with fans coming up. Uh, as we talked a moment ago, uh, a lot of people may or may not know not only uh, – do you you do uh, acting work and some movies coming out we're going to be talking about too but uh 
you're actually a writer. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of your uh, literary uh, endeavors. Well, um, I wrote for magazines for many years, and then uh, in recent years I've been writing film and uh, doing some book writing. And I just last year completed a documentary film that I wrote and directed, and so I do a lot of that screenwriting, I mean uh, documentary film writing. I'm just in the middle now of a, of a new script for a, a feature film, which is actually a sort of a drama thriller. And it's got a few more weeks of rewriting to go before we get to that, you know, that official first draft stage that you can show to people. But yeah. And you told me too, uh, you got a couple movies coming out you'd like to promote as well, I guess. Yeah, I uh, I worked on a picture called Gimme Skelter, which is a terrific film. Uh, the premise is there's a guy in his 20s who's convinced he's the unacknowledged son of uh, Charlie Manson. And so he has his little group of followers, and they pick a town in New Mexico of 67 people and decide they're going to kill as many people as they can in one night because it'll force Manson to acknowledge him. And, of course, everything goes wrong, but it's a really good movie, well-written movie. And then another one that I worked on last year um, is called Brutal Massacre, which stars David Naughton of, uh, of uh, American Werewolf. And uh, it's actually a comedy and uh, it's a mockumentary about a guy who uh, is desperately trying to make one more horror film and hoping it's a hit. He's a, the director of a, his first horror movie was a big hit. He's had a string of lousy, unsuccessful movies since, and he knows if this one doesn't get, you know, if this one isn't a success, he'll never make another one. So it's a great film. It's going to be released in theaters uh, next month by Anchor Bay, limited theatrical, and then it'll be out on video after that. Well, I'll tell you what, we won't take up any more of your time because we know you got uh, folks that are going to be wanting to talk to you and get some more signatures and whatnot, but is there a website folks can go to if they want to visit you online? Yes, it's uh, GunnarHanson.com, all one word. GunnarHanson.com. Mr. Gunnar Hansen, thank you so much for the time, sir. You have a great weekend. Well, folks, you Dead Pit fans are uh, familiar with this gentleman here. You've done, uh, you, you've, you've heard him. But now we're going to bring you the visual. It's Mr. Lou Perryman, of course, uh, world famous as L.G. Peters in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, uh, builder of the Fry Shack, and unfortunately uh, meets a terrible, terrible demise at the hands of Leatherface. How you doing today? Doing fine, doing fine. Happy to be here. He didn't really die, of course. Well, you know, that was one thing that, uh, you know, LG was just, he was pretty much, uh, he, he, he took a licking and kept on ticking. And I would certainly think that, uh, you know, maybe there's a possibility he can come back with some reconstructive surgery if they, uh, if they choose to do that. True love knows no limits. You know, this girl is, is defenseless. He's got, to, he's got to fully save the girl. Just save the girl. Like John Houston said in Chinatown, he said, just find the girl, Mr. Gitz. Well, you know, LG certainly was dedicated to Stretch, and uh, I think I think everybody that watched the movie was kind of pulling for the two of them to, to hook up. Uh, but unfortunately, that that didn't happen. At least in at least in part two. Who knows? Maybe later on down the line. Well, uh, first time here uh, in uh, Dallas for a convention, or you do this pretty regularly? First time for the Fear Fest. I missed last year. I got sick. Um, did a Frightmare Weekend here uh, a year or two ago. And I've been to some other conventions, Chiller and Cinema Wasteland, and really enjoyed those. Been to Cinema Wasteland twice, Chiller once, okay. so that's been a lot of fun. Well, do you, uh, do you, I'm sure probably uh, people see you on the street, people see you coming in the hotel. A lot of the, a lot of the guests here that have been in horror movies, of course, have the, uh, have the advantage of being masked or in heavy prosthetics. Do you, do you get stopped a lot? Hey, you're, uh, you're LG. I do, I do here, I do. Yeah, at a convention I do. Uh, rarely uh, anywhere else. Uh, but but here uh, it's amazing. My first show was Cinema Wasteland, and it just blew my mind. It, just to see how many people had had got on to LG and and liked Chainsaw Two, and I had pretty much forgotten all that and just didn't know all this was going on. I didn't know these shows were going on, and so it's just been a, an absolute hoot to come here. And one last question. We won't take up too much of your time, but the uh, the prosthetics 
for the uh, for the skinned LG. I mean, how uncomfortable, A, I can imagine, to have to walk around on a set in your boxer shorts, but to have your skin on your chest, down your leg, all over your face missing, uh, how long was that process to get you into that makeup, and how uncomfortable actually was it? Uh, it wasn't that uncomfortable wearing it. It was, uh, there was some element of uh, be gentle with it and delicate with it, but but it, it fit. It was form fit. They cast my body, so it fit me. And, you know, and, uh, and so they built a slant board where I went and lay down about 2 o'clock in the morning. And, um, and I went to sleep just like I was supposed to. And I woke up, you know, I guess I just went ahead and got in my boxer shorts. And, uh, and go, to, go to sleep, go to sleep normal, you wake up skinned. And I wake up skinned. And then in rush hour traffic in Austin, we're driving across town, and I'm waving at the people in the next cars. And Now, that that, uh, that layer, I guess, that was built in the old Austin American Statesman building, wasn't it? Uh, newspaper? It was, all full of ink that sprayed and full of offices. So the studio, the radio station was there. The exterior was another little building. Just really 100 yards away, in in a very undeveloped old Austin. Uh, so a lot of people really enjoy seeing the movie just for that reason, just to see old Austin. But I was on the table for about seven hours, six seven hours, and then I couldn't stop and I couldn't eat, and so they only did it once. So we had to shoot me out then. So I finished up late that night. So after the makeup, I probably then put in another 12 to 16 hours. Well, anything else on the horizon? Any uh, websites you want to promote? Any uh, any more conventions you're going to be going to this year? You can tell the folks about who may not be uh, be near us today. Uh, well, I'm getting I'm getting ready to go to Crypticon in um, in Seattle in May, and um, you know, back when I first got started as an actor. Uh, there was a bunch of us, Eagle Pinnell, Sonny Davis, and myself, uh, started doing some movies. Did a short called A Hell of a Note, and our first feature called The Whole Shooting Match. And it pretty much, those pretty much got lost. And Eagle, unfortunately, drank himself to death. And, um, and so we're being restoring The Whole Shooting Match. And, uh, it's I, I have a really friend who is a big fan of that. I personally have never seen it. I'd like to see that. Oh, it's a good movie. You'd like it. It's a good movie. It's got a good heart. And it's being restored in high definition. And Sonny just moved back from L.A. So we're talking about waking up these two characters. I played a guy named Lloyd, and he played Frank, and uh, put them on video and put them on the Internet. Oh, okay. So we're talking about we don't have a title yet, maybe uh, Living the Dream. Yeah. Maybe Frank and Lloyd, maybe Lloyd and Frank. We like to argue about that. Nah, yeah. Lloyd and Frank, no. Nah, you know, but we're, we're trying to get something going on that. We're going to shoot something in April and see how it goes. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, folks. Uh, like I said before, you got to hear him. We let you see him. Lou Perryman, thank you so much for taking time with us today. Thank you you have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, it is Fear Fest 2 in Dallas, Texas. And uh, speaking of Dallas, this man needs absolutely no introduction. It's Diamond Dallas Page. DDP to your friends. Uh, man, it's great to be able to spend some time with you. You've got a lot of stuff to promote. Of course, um, uh, the movie Driftwood. Uh, you've got, a, what, a, I guess a series of uh, workout videos, too? Yeah. I, um, you know, a lot of people think that once you get done with one career, you, you might move off to doing something, training people or, you know, workout videos. But that's not really what happened with me. Uh, in 1998, in the prime of my career, you have to understand, I didn't start wrestling until I was 35. Tore my rotator cuff at 36, they fired me. I came back at 37, and so technically my career was really starting at 37. And to put that in perspective, Stone Cold Steve Austin, he retired at 37. I was technically starting my career, and uh, it didn't blow up till I was 40 years old in 1996. And then, boom, I was on top of the world, 96, 97, 98. And then I ruptured my L4 and L5 so badly in the lower part of my back that I had three doctors tell my wrestling career was over. Around that time, my wife was trying to uh, try to get me to try to do yoga to heal my body. Okay. And my mindset, the first 42 years of my life to yoga was yoga. You go from the doing the diamond cutter to doing yoga. I, I mean, I was I wouldn't be caught dead doing yoga. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it just was incomprehensible to me. But I just signed a $4.7 million three-year downsize deal okay. okay so 
you learn to adapt. Yeah, exactly. So I started doing power yoga, and within three weeks, I started to feel a significant difference. And so what I did was started to change things right away. I started throwing old school calisthenics where you go down for three seconds, hold for three seconds, up for three seconds on your push-ups, yeah. build a five, build a ten. I threw in isometrics and isokinetics, which means the engaging of muscles as you move from one position to another, which jacks your heart rate up, got you in a fat burning zone. And also I started my the difference between yoga and YRG, yoga'd be like a bicycle. YRG's more like a Harley. You know, I mean, got some of the biggest, baddest SOBs on the planet doing it. Yeah. And it's changing lives. If you go to DiamondDallasPage.com or YRGWorkout.com, you'll see some of the greatest testimonies of people who have, you know, changed their life. Exactly. And one of them is a guy named Arthur Borman, who is a disabled veteran who literally went from walking on canes for 15 years. Mm -hmm blew up to 297 pounds and had knee braces, back braces, and walking those kinks for 15 years. If you go to YRGWorkout.com, I'll talk for a minute. I'll say, but don't take my word for it. Hit play beneath me and watch the video of Arthur Borman. I will guarantee you it'll be the most impressive, inspirational video you've ever seen. The guy goes loses 137 pounds and in 11 months is not only walking but running but sprinting. And you have to see it to believe it. And his son documented everything. So I just, you know, put a big deal together that I can't acknowledge who I've put it together with. But I have a huge infomercial coming out this summer, hopefully the latest by New Year's. And that's going to redefine, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to eclipse what Diamond Dallas Page the wrestler was. Yeah. Because people are going to know as Diamond Dallas Page, the guy who created YRG. And it's, you know... It's, it's my pet project of everything I'm doing because I'm so passionate about it. And anytime you can, like in wrestling, I, I affect a lot of people and help people, you know, be inspired. You know, I was the guy who never should have happened. Yeah. You started 35 years old, really 37 years old. You know, 42 years old, they say your wrestling career is over. 43, I'm the heavyweight champion in the world. Yeah. You know, I, I, I constantly try to throw out anything's possible. Yeah. Well, you definitely have got a lot of irons in the fire still with your acting. Uh, we won't keep you long. I know you're uh, you're you're fixing to go on a very important trip. Uh, one thing that you know is always uh, impressive when uh, celebrities such as yourself make uh, make a trip over to Afghanistan, which is what you're going to be doing here just pretty soon well, to uh, visit got, the troops. I just got back from Afghanistan. Oh, okay, I, I thought you were fixing to leave to go to Afghanistan. No, I'm leaving for Iraq in two oh, hours. Okay. <laughs> so it's Iraq you're actually going to visit yeah. the troops. Right. I guess they love seeing you over there. Well, a lot of those kids grew up watching me, yeah. you know, so it's really uh, it's really a cool feeling, you know, because I, I, I do the autographs and the pictures, but then, you know, I take them through my YRG workout, yeah. and I also do a lot of inspirational speaking. I speak on a concept I developed called Living Life at 90%, the concept being life's 10% of what happened to you, 90% of how you react to it, and the bottom line is, is that... It's, those guys need to be inspired. Yeah. They, I'm there to help bring up the morale. And I've been to Iraq, it's my third trip. Okay. And my, my first trip was to Afghanistan a month ago. So um, I know that once I get back, we are right into the, you know, the infomercial and the building of the infomercial of the YRG workout. And what's, what's great about YRG is I can do it with a guy who's 476 pounds, like one of the guys on my site, Big Rob. They're like me. You know, or like you, or, or them. And I can put you all through the same workout. If you modify it, and the guy who's 400 pounds modifies it and does what I tell him to do, I can still take those other guys who are over there and kick their asses. Yeah. But you just need to modify if till you get to that level. So when I go over there, most of those guys are really great shape to begin with. So I take it to the extreme YRG. And at the end of um, one of the uh, – in Afghanistan last month, at the end of one of our uh, – Workouts, about, about about forty or fifty guys there, and these are all guys, by the way, wouldn't be caught dead doing yoga, oh, yeah. but they'll do YRG, especially with DDP. Uh, the one kid looks at me and he goes, "Man, he goes, I cannot believe a non-military man just kicked our ass like that." And I said, "How old are you, buddy?" He says, "22." I said, "Then you need to preface that with a 51-year-old non-military man just kicked your ass." I said. I'm going to be 52 next month. 
you're 22. Imagine what you could do if you were doing this like I was. Exactly. I'll tell you what, I know we've got a lot of folks lining up wanting to talk to you, do some more interviews. Uh, DiamondDallasPays.com, YRGWorkout.com. YRGWorkout.com. Check it out. It'll not only change your life, it'll help you own your life and let you feel the bang. Man, we appreciate the time. Hey, have a safe time. Shot at him anyway. Got a good shot at Robert Aiken. Yes, there is. We don't talk to him. At least we got a shot at him. <laughs> He's the man behind the glass, and he's out of control. He's back. The man behind the glass, and he crawled out. Once again, it is Fear Fest 2, and uh, Ari Lehman, first Jason. First Jason means a lot, not only in context of the the movies, the very first Jason, but also another uh, another uh, part of your uh, your repertoire here. First Jason, the band. Tell us a little bit. You guys played last night here at the uh, at the uh, Westin. What what was that like? Oh yes, we did. Yes, we did, my friend. And we we had the honor of opening for the great Michael Graves. And uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, we we have we have a great band. Uh, a bass player from Macabre named Nefarious uh -huh. is with us, and we have a great guitarist, Chris Karloff. And then uh, our drummer is actually from Transylvania, and his name is Vlad. So we call him Vlad the Impaler. He plays double bass drum. Vlad, I guess, a pretty common name in Transylvania. Oh, yeah, man. You know, but he's uh, he's great double bass drum player, and you know. We, we kind of do a, a sort of speed metal, hardcore, punk, monster rock sort of thing. And uh, I, I created this instrument. I took a keyboard and I duct taped it to a big Chinese wooden sword. And then I put a, a guitar strap on it. So it's not the keyboard anymore. It's a key sword. Key sword okay. And I wear it like a guitar. And I play that for the whole show. And I put it through this distortion box kind of thing. So it comes out, it sounds just like a guitar, you know? Yeah. So uh, this thing looks so strange that it gets everybody's attention in the audience. And so it pulls them in, and then we hit them with songs like Jason is Watching, Jason Never Dies, Machete is My Friend, and... Oh! Oh, whoa, 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 whoa! Hey, look out! Hey, look out! Hey, look out! Hey, look out! Oh! Yeah, it's hard. You, 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 you never know what's going to happen at these. <laughs> do, do, do you find that the, 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 the later Jasons uh, have an animosity towards you as being the first Jason? <laughs> it, seems, it seems maybe as such, but who knows? They're terribly jealous, I tell you. I tell you. But yeah, yeah, let me, I can even give you a little taste of one of the songs. Because, you know, Jason has no voice. So first Jason gives Jason a voice. And for instance, like, uh, there's one where I say... Uh, Hey, Freddy Krueger, you don't scare me. You were just a dream. Hey, Michael Myers, you don't scare me. Not even on Halloween. Hannibal Lecter, you don't scare me. I'll eat you alive. I'll take on every adversary. Jason will survive. Leather, Leatherface get mentioned in the song, too, or no? Yeah, but I call Thank you. I call him Bubba Sawyer. I say, I say, Bubba Sawyer, you don't scare me. Your chainsaw just broke down. So for uh, paraphernalia, CDs, uh, all that kind of stuff, got a website you can tell the folks about. Let them, yeah. let them take a look. Please come on by firstjason.com or MySpace, First Jason. We're going to be touring around the U.S. Um, hopefully we'll be in, in your area soon. So just, just check out First Jason and come by the website and, you know, stop by the guest book. We're going to be coming out with a new album soon called Machete is My Friend. So keep an eye out for that. Well, I'll tell you what, we certainly appreciate the time. We've talked to all the Jasons, but it, you're the only one that's, that's actually had a song for us. <laughs> Ari Lehman, firstjason.com. Check it out. Ladies and gentlemen, from Fear Fest 2, Mr. Ed Neal. <laughs> Hi, Mike. How you doing? You know, the best thing about doing these conventions... Besides the vodka, 
is uh, getting my laptop and my phone out and hooking up with deadpit.com and uh, finding out what's going on in the horror industry. <laughs> hey, we're having big fun out here, and we hope to see you at a convention soon. And check out deadpit.com. They the bomb, baby. They better, they better than head cheese. <laughs> Uh, well, our movie is Bubba's Chili Parlor. It's a um, filmed entirely here in East Texas. It's kind of a uh, throwback uh, to the old days, you know, kind of a, almost a B-movie feel with a drive-in effect to it. It's a zombie movie. It's about a guy who owns a restaurant in East Texas, and he unwittingly unleashes the zombie epidemic on the world. But it all starts in this small town, so... Um, it's really good. We had some good special effects, some uh, good actors. Pretty much financed it ourselves. We all got together. We've worked together for uh, a while. We're bartenders and stuff. Um, Audrey is is the star of the movie. My character is like, oh god, like scary, scary, sweet, horrific, lovable, mm. divine. And Joey Evans, he's a director and co-writer. Uh, yeah, um, it's uh, the whole idea behind the movie is um, uh, when I, younger, when I was a kid, I used to go to the drive-in movie a lot, and um, always that's basically my early film experiences with the drive-in movie. And so I wanted to actually make a drive-in movie. I thought it'd be fun to make a drive-in movie. And when we went into production, I knew um, that our budget wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have a really polished film that was going to have a B movie. Uh, feel to it. So we shot the movie. We we had some of the um, the humor kind of kind of uh, if you used to compare it to anything, it's kind of like Army of Darkness or uh, you know even uh, Bad Taste by uh, Peter Jackson's first movie. And uh, it's got some of that kind of throwback humor mixed in with the horror and uh, or the you know the the blood and guts. And uh, in edit, we I framed the movie with uh, the kind of a drive-in feel. So it's got fake intermissions. Um, it's got a fake commercials all the commercials are Bubba's chili parlor commercials so yeah and in in, when you're when you're in an intermission break during the movie you're you're seeing a commercial for Bubba's chili parlor he brought the movie to you and then of course it goes right back into the movie uh, which is a zombie a zombie horror movie like Mike said it's it's uh, it's a mutated strain of mad cow disease that uh, begins its outbreak in, in the Bubba's little restaurant in rural Texas um, it's it Escaped from a, a nearby U.S. government research facility. They were testing it to weaponize it. And, uh, uh, of course, Audrey here, my daughter, she plays the character that becomes the zombie that uh, escapes into the nearby big city of Dallas and and uh, infects the city, and it goes from there. You know, this was really a work of uh, a work of love from all of us. Joey and I bartended together for 11 years. Uh, we've known Mike a long time. He... Uh, when we first even started this, made our first short uh, of Bubba's Chili Parlor, Mike was bartending at a place down the street from us, and we shot it in uh, his restaurant after hours. Um, and then for the next couple of years, you know, we, we made it, we, we worked it into a feature, uh, and tried to get backing, and um, it was it was tough. We you know we had people would would uh, they'd promise us money a month later, the money wouldn't be there. Uh, after a while, we just figured we had to go all out. You know, it was it was now or never, and um, we just we pooled all our resources, uh, called in favors from friends, and that's how we made the movie. Uh, it's it's you know people work you know nonstop, basically uh, work at your regular job a few days a week, then uh, shoot a few days a week, uh, no breaks in between, and uh, had a lot of our friends turn out to help us. Um, a lot of uh, some, a lot of locals from Will's Point, you know, made this really made this possible, uh, letting us use uh, their 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 land as as our set, um, you know, helping us out with props, and uh, it was really, you know, if it wasn't for all the people committed to this movie and, and uh, wanting to see it get made, it, it couldn't have been made because we we just didn't have the money to do it otherwise. So it really, it's uh, it's just a work of passion from everybody that was involved with it. Uh, you can go to www.bubbaschiliparlor.com. Or on MySpace. Or uh, check out. Uh, you can uh, MySpace, yes. Uh, 
look for Bubba's Chili Parlor or Death is Served on MySpace. Uh, you should get plenty of hits from all of us linking to that. So, Once again from Fear Fest 2, Ray Boucher here with Joe Moe from uh, Red Velvet, the uh, co-writer. And uh, we want to talk a little bit about the movie. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, we're really proud of it. We're monster fans making monster movies for monster fans. Uh, we've been around the genre a long time. I'm with Forey Ackerman, one of the old timers of horror. I live with Forey in his museum. We take care of each other. He's 91 years old, and he's really proud of us for having finally stepped out of his shadow and made our own feature here. Well, you know, of course, uh, everybody, uh, if, if you don't know who Forrest Ackerman is, uh, Famous Monsters Magazine, among other publications, uh, great to hear that he's still alive and doing well. He's doing great, and all of his, his the kids that read his magazine, um, little kids that became people you might have heard of, you know, the Spielbergs and James Camerons, Lucases, Guillermo del Toro, all of his fans, uh, and hopefully we're some fans joining the ranks of filmmakers uh, making scary movies that we all look forward to seeing. Well, tell us a little bit about Red Velvet. Now, of course, uh, I don't know if you can see here, Jay, but we've got, uh, we'll, we'll get a shot of some of the uh, some of the stuff here in a minute. Uh, stars Henry Thomas. Uh, who else is in the movie? Kelly Garner, who probably many of you fans know from Bully. Um, she's an up-and-comer. Um, she's brilliant and beautiful. I wish she could have been here with us. Um, she's doing a play on Broadway right now with uh, Diane Wiest. But uh, hopefully we'll see her more in fandom because she's, she's really a force to be reckoned with and absolutely beautiful. She and Henry Thomas, the other lead in our movie, um, have amazing chemistry. And uh, we, we picked actors first, you know. Every Give us, give us a little uh, synopsis of Red Velvet. Uh, certainly got a unique character here. Uh, you've got some props from the movie, a nice-looking severed head. What exactly is Red Velvet about? Well, Red Velvet, uh, we like to call it a deconstructed slasher film. And by that, we mean that we, we know our horror marks and we try to hit them, uh, but we also try to push the envelope a little bit. And the way we do that is we play with, uh, with conventions of, of the slasher movie. We give you lots of red. But it's stylized. When we come to our gore, it's fantasy. Um, blood might, in this, in some instance, be car paint with metal flakes in it. It might be tar in another point. There's sparkles and glitters and things. We tried to make it enjoyable. There's plenty of torture porn out there, and we have nothing against it. But it's, it's out there, and if you want to see real pain and suffering, you can go on the Internet. So this is sort of an old-school throwback to the days of uh, entertaining slasher stuff, where you leave the theater feeling excited but not that disturbed. <laughs> And tell us about the uh, the slasher who, as we uh, asked you earlier, you're just kind of referring to him as the maniac. You don't really have a don't really have a name name for him yet, huh? Nope. And we look to you to help us determine if he's going to have a nickname or not. But he he was created, uh, you know, in our story. Henry Thomas is telling the story, uh, a fantasy story of this maniac murdering Kelly's friends at this party that she'd miss. So they collaborate together and they create this fantasy character. In the case of our maniac, he wears um, speakers on his head that look like bunny ears, but they actually broadcast the sounds of his last victim or maybe some theme music, other scary sounds. And he's got a Polaroid on his head, so the last thing you see is your own screaming face in front of you when, right before you go out. So um, he's kind of a high-tech, woodsy, you know, forest creature. Um, I'm assuming he enjoys using a hammer on his victim. He, you know, his, his weapon of choice is a hammer, although he does use other and sundry things that you might find in a tool shed. A lumberjack's tool shed. You have a two-man saw, things like that. Well, uh, hey, I tell you what, we, we appreciate you taking time to talk with us. Uh, give us a website. We know there's got to be one out there. Maybe uh, fans can watch the trailer online, I guess? Absolutely. We've just put up an HD trailer for you that we're really proud of. We shot this film in 35 millimeter for you, so it's a big, glamorous movie. Um, our website address is www.redvelvetmovie.com. We've got lots of free swag there for you, ringtones, all kinds of things you can have. And if you come out to the conventions and, and support genre like, like we do, we've got lots of free stuff we'll throw at you too, posters and pictures. And by the way, point of interest, our, our cast always signs for free. We're old school. Very, uh, very important to a lot of the fans who come out here. And, you know, honestly, you, you could... You can spend a couple of grand just on autographs alone. Yeah, we don't begrudge anybody, you know, charging what, they, what they're worth to have something signed. But, you know, we're you, and we're really grateful to be able to be in this business and for the opportunity. And our stars, you know, Henry Thomas is with us today at Fear Fest, too, and he's never done a convention. You know, but he really believes in this movie, and he agrees with us that um, 
we're really here to, to be among our people and to, to give back and, you know, take criticism, take input, take, take whatever we can. Because this isn't the last movie we're going to make. It's the first, but we got a lot ahead of us. And we're looking forward to showing you what we we're, got. We're looking forward to seeing it. Joe, thank you very much. Redvelvetmovie.com. Check it out. Love it. Movie. Give me some sugar, baby. All right, well, my name is Jason Craig. I am the artist of the Freddy vs. Jason vs. Ash series. Uh, really kind of kicked off this little horror run with uh, the Grim Fairy Tales, uh, followed up with uh, a little bit on a reanimator series that sadly didn't happen. And we came back, kicked off with Seven. And with the success of Seven, New Line Cinema actually approached us to do a Nightmare on Elm Street series, three issues. And I literally got about five pages into it, and they saw the pages, saw some of the prints, and said, uh, we want you on the Freddy vs. Jason vs. Ash. Uh, I literally springboarded onto that one, leaving the other one untouched. And uh, we're now, actually, I'm at the done stage. The, the series is over. Issue 5 has just came out. Issue 1, 2, 3, and 4 has sold out, gone to second re second print, and those are beginning to sell out. And Issue 5 is selling in the same cord. Issue 6 will be out here in a few weeks. And it's looking like uh, very positive that we're going to be doing a sequel to the Freddy Jason Ash series now. So much so, we're changing the ending to Issue 6 so we can do a sequel. Have to cut this together somehow. And much like uh, DVDs, the the original ending will that maybe ever be seen in any way, shape, or form? We're we're actually talking about doing in the trade paperback um, a few alternate endings, maybe one, maybe two. The actual the actual uh, uh, script treatment had a had a beautiful photogenic. Uh, to me, I called it the teaser trailer moment, that teaser poster moment which was this, the script, the movie was going to end with Ash's car sitting on top of Jason at the bottom of Crystal Lake. And then you would like zoom in and he'd open up his eye and you'd hear the ch, -ch, -ch and you'd credit to roll. That was how the script, scripted ending was. The, the, the book series was kind of meant more of a way to cap it all off. And New Line, I think, actually just wanted to end it. They wanted it to kind of kill it off. And we had an ending that, that kind of did that. And now with the sequel talk, the success of the series, we had to come back and do a different ending that's kind of living it more with the MacGuffin and making it more ominous. So you're like, what happens to them? So you want to see the sequel. Well, of course, I picked up the first five issues from you guys Friday, read them all that evening in one sitting, and uh, very excited about seeing how it wraps up and definitely the sequel. Artwork is beautiful. Uh, and, of course, uh, one other important aspect is the uh, the coloring, beautiful colorization in the uh, in the book as well. And, sir, uh, let the folks at home out there know who you are and your, your part in the uh, the series. Well, I, my name is Rex Sabs. Uh, I've been working with, with Thomas Mason, who's our main colorist. So unfortunately, he's having to wrap up the book, too, so he couldn't be here. Uh, my job, pretty much, I lay the flats down for him, the basic coloring, basic black, black, you know, background coloring, I'm sorry. Get it ready to where he can go in and maybe within an hour have the page ready to go. I mean, just we, we just try to make it to where he can pump it out as fast as he can. So so between he and I, we we just work well. It, it's just a good team. We're just a, a good studio here, really. Yeah, that, really a good that thing. Was probably the key to this series, I think, which was not no disrespect to Wildstorm or DC, but the way the project was normally going to be handled was like a standard book. I hand it into the studio, the studio hands off to somebody else, to anybody else, and it kind of. But with this, we're all good friends. We're all horror nuts, and it's very collaborative. So, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, I can go, "Oh my God, I got this brainstorm of an idea." You know, I can call Cats, I can call Tom, I can call you know, whoever. And we can, you know, pile in together, and, and I think that's really helped the series because we're all fans of it, and, and the communication's there, and we all just it just really work well together. And everybody just listens to each other. I mean, we yeah, we, no, we take it into consideration. I mean, no egos at all. I mean, Jeff Katz, you know, he's a you know, VP at 20th Century Fox now, and talking to him is like talking to, like, the biggest four, and, uh, you know, he's just, he loves the genre. That's when he was a VP at New Line Cinema, that was his, that was why he was there. He'll tell you, I, he loves that aspect of it. And then I, you know, can't blame him. That's, that's, 
best part of it. Well, I'll tell you what, it is definitely the matchup the fans have been hollering for, and I can say probably pretty sincerely, if you're ever going to see it, this is the only way you're going to see it is in this format. Uh, great series and uh, website that folks can go to to check out uh, not only this, but other stuff that you guys are working on. Well, we have our our studio site, which is the uh, rumental.com. And it's just just how it's spelled. It's R and then U and mental.com. Uh, Freddie versus Jason versus Ash does have a MySpace page. And through that page, it actually has all of our individual pages. So people can contact us through that. Like you said, there's no egos there. So we answer our MySpace fans. We add you to the list. We don't. You know, we don't do like a lot of you know, yeah. celebrities do or whatever because we're not that big yet. So, I mean, and yet, maybe be, in one the, day. yet be in the keyword. Maybe one day. But, yeah, but even then. I, but even then, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Yeah. I, I'm, I have always been a fanboy of art, man. I love, I come to these things and I, I almost say I hate sitting here because I want to be out there like meeting everybody. I yeah. just, I see them and I'm going in fanboy mode. <laughs> I'll tell you what, guys, we appreciate you taking the time. Make sure you check out the websites, buy the book, read the book. Freddie versus Jason versus Ash. We're here at Fear Fest 2. This is Ray Boucher. Check everything out, guys. See you later. Boucher here once again, Fear Fest 2 for DeadPit.com. We're about to cut out. It's Sunday. It's the final day, our final interview. And who better? PJ Souls, of course, John Carpenter's Halloween, Stripes, more recently, The Devil's Rejects, many, many more. My personal favorite, one of my all time favorite movies. So glad when I finally got it on DVD a couple years ago, Rock and Roll High School. Uh, we certainly appreciate you taking time to talk to us today. How's the uh, how's the Texas crowd been treating you? Really, really nice. I, I can't. There hasn't really been a better crowd. Everybody's been so sweet and so nice, and really appreciates all the movies that I've been in, and just they're just thrilled to be here. So some of them have driven from way. I mean, you guys have a. A big state, so they've been been driving a long time. <laughs> well, you know, of course, uh, being a horror convention, I'm sure you've had your share of fans that, that, you know, want the Halloween photos, the Devil's Rejects photos, that kind of stuff signed. Uh, going back to Rock and Roll High School, just one aspect of it, uh, the commentary on the DVD with, uh, I think it was Dee Dee maybe. Uh, None of the Ramones are left anymore, really. You know, it, it's it's a terrible shame they were all taken so early. Uh, what was it like working on that movie? Uh, uh, what was that, 78, 79, something like that? Uh, yeah, it was 70, 78, and uh, it was awesome. And, yes, very sad. Only Marky's left. But I have wonderful memories from making filming that movie. And, uh, yeah, actually 50% of the people that have come by my table here at uh, Fear Fest, they actually wanted pictures from Rock and Roll High School. So, as much as they kept looking and staring at the Halloween ones and, you know, bringing their DVDs from Devil's Rejects or whatever, they were like, oh, I love Rock and Roll High School. It's my favorite. <laughs> well, I think I think everybody, male or female, especially people around my age group, uh, we've all got a little bit of Riff Randall in us, I guess. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Uh, got a website, anything you want to uh, want to uh, promote while we're here? Um, there's going to be a PJSouls.com. It's, it's in the works, but I do have a MySpace. It's the official PJ Souls MySpace. You just go to PJ Souls. I don't think it's, it's somebody else, but the official PJ Souls. And lots of stuff on there from Stars Magazine. They're the ones that set it up for me. So enjoy it. And thank you. Thank you, Dallas. You've been real sweet. And I love Bone Daddy. <laughs> well, ma'am, I tell you what, once again, thank you so much for taking the time. The one, the only PJ Souls. Goodbye from Fear Fest. And uh, we'll catch you next time. About the zero I want you to